This podcast is part of the Gunna Geek Network. The Opinion Express may not represent other podcasts or affiliates of Gunna Geek. Check out more podcasts at GunnaGeek.com and get ready because geekiness starts in 3, 2, 1. You have been granted clearance by director Phil Coulson. Stand by for S.H.I.E.L.D. debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. I'm Agent Lauren. I am. Am I an agent yet? Uh, we still haven't. You know, it's st- we need to There's interview. There's some paperwork. Yeah. Just- I'm an intern. My name is Ferris. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe podcast. This is podcast number 84 on Daredevil Season 1, Episode 9, Speak of the Devil. This podcast is recorded on Wednesday, August 5th, 2015. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan-based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Marvel's Agent Carter, Marvel's Daredevil on Netflix, and the general Marvel comic universe. Because of Flaming Ninjas. (laughs) If you'd like to talk to us about Flaming Ninjas, which, by the way, sounds like a mixed drink. Burn. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. You can contact us on our website, legendsofshield.com. We have a voicemail, 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. You can also get a hold of us at our Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, all Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or our YouTube, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And you can find us at our forums, forums forums.gunnageek.com, or search Gunna Geek, all one word, on the Tap Talk app. This time on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we'll be welcoming Ferris formally to the podcast. We're going to, again, talk about our Ant-Man Marvel Crate giveaway. We're going to go in-depth on the Daredevil episode, Speak of the Devil. We'll talk a lot about our weekly comic book news, and we'll go into the general Marvel news and your feedback, as always. Ferris, welcome to the podcast, sir, again. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's great. We just, uh, can you come every week, maybe? Absolutely. Anything for you guys. Aw, big hug. You know, we we go way back from that place with the thing, and I'm never going to forget him. (laughs) (laughs) There was some beer involved, if I remember correctly. (laughs) There's some liquor involved, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, it's great having you back here in the podcast, and you definitely have a large comic background, but you also, heck, you do a comic strip yourself. Hey, if you want to call it that, I do a very bad (laughs) webcomic, but uh, if you like that kind of thing, take a look for Suburban Metal Dad on an interweb near you. I get those references. It's great. (laughs) (laughs) But hey, Bloom County is back now, so they don't need me. I might be able to hang it up. So, we have a Ant-Man Marvel crate. It was given to us by an anonymous donor, and we are giving it away. And all you have to do is give us your funny review of the movie of Ant-Man. You can do it at any of the ways to contact us. Email, voicemail, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Get a hold of us. You can even put a review on iTunes of our podcast with the funny Ant-Man review. And then, Can I ring in right now? Yeah, go ahead. We'll wait. Um, I'll- Man, can you hold it? I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> Be funny right now. Go. Uh, do it. Do it. Do it. Uh, uh, damn, somebody else can have it. Okay. <laughs> I have failed you. You have failed this city. So we have this going on, and we really look forward to your Ant-Man reviews, because let's face it, it was a funny summer popcorn movie. So there you go. All right. Speak of the devil. Another great Daredevil episode. You see. The title is two things, like they're speaking literally about the devil, and daredevil is like devil, so speak of the devil is like on, you know, it it plays into the episode's theme of duality. It does. I mean, this whole thing is kind of the origins story, right? But this is, he gets the crate out, the box out, right, the locker with all the stuff in, and he actually puts on some of the stuff for the first time. Yeah. And he talks to the priest. Yes, that was a good conversation, too. Like, that whole scene with the priest and everything, it was one of those ones that, you know, you just can't look away from the screen while that's going on. No. Okay, so I had a problem watching this 
episode. So I'm watching it on the treadmill last night, rewatching it, of course, because we watched it back in April. And this is August. So where I'm, I'm on the treadmill and I'm running and I'm trying to take notes, but I have to look down as I'm running, taking notes on my iPhone. Don't want to drop the <laughs> iPhone, but yet want to. And that's keep... how we lost Star Pie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, he impaled himself on a pin. <laughs> and want to keep my eyes on the screen the entire time. I had to rewind it a couple of times just because I was taking a notes and I missed something. So it it was captive. It was one that you didn't want. Well, look away. It, you know, the priest conversation, the one at the beginning, the one at the end, the whole latte thing. It's not confession, but it is. And the priest knows exactly what's going on. And the whole conversation with the priest about what the devil was, that was like, wow, just mind blown. I did like that. I mean, it's a very slow episode, we'll say, but I think that monologue alone warrants the rest of the episode. I mean, it has some action in it, no question, but that monologue, I think, will look back as one of the standout points of the series. Yeah, the cold opening for the episode was the fight between the red guy and the black guy, which you later know <laughs> That's is... That's racist. <laughs> <laughs> which you later know is Daredevil and... Is it Nobu? Nobu. 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 Yes. Yeah. And you know that from the beginning, but you don't have a clue how it got there. You don't know where they are, what they're fighting over. You, you don't know. And actually, I think it cuts back at least twice more, if not three times more, before they finally get to the very end of it. And so you have this intense fight going on throughout the entire episode. And it's just, wow, it's hard to keep in touch with it. And then it goes back to, after the cold opening, it goes back to the priest talk. And then you get into Ben and Karen and Foggy talking. And of course, it starts the Foggy quips like attorney at what the hell matters or whatever. <laughs> okay, there's so much stuff in this that kind of when I first watched through it, I didn't really notice. And now that I'm watching through it with more of an eye to how it's going to connect into the other series and the Marvel Universe at large, things like why I just completely overlooked this the first time, but why Nobu insisted that that one building had to be one that he needed. Yeah, what was up with that? I don't know. I think if it pays off, it's going to be like in the Iron Fist series, because he's very clearly with the hand. I mean, even without the whole Red Ninja getup, we kind of know that by now. Now, at this point, are they still debating whether or not there will be the mystical angle to Iron Fist? I think there has to be. There has to be. I mean, they've set up the hand. That's what I think, but they were talking about maybe not. Well, if you're going to do the Sorcerer Supreme, why would you shy away from having magic in Iron Fist? I'm with you. Yeah, it, it seems really clear to me that they're setting up the more mystical parts of the Marvel Universe here. Mm -hmm. And talking about all the stuff about Stick being trained in their ways and things like that. So is Stick, like, formerly of the hand, or is he... Just somebody who uh, knows their ways because of somebody else who was formerly of the hand. When they say that they have somebody with those skills who could take out Daredevil, I didn't give any thought to it the first time. Do they mean Electra? Is that why Electra's being called in in you know season two? That's what it seems to be referring to. I'm still doing my Marvel Unlimited deep dive on Daredevil, and if you're keeping track at home, the hand stuff ties in with issues around. 170, 174, give or take, if you want to see what it's based in. And, and that is kind of in the heart of the Electra saga. And uh, as you will find out, he is not the only red ninja running around. <laughs> no. And then uh, later on in the episode, kind of a minor thing, but it's something that we brought up before. Karen says that we can't outrun our pasts. And she's talking about it in connection with Wilson Fisk. But we've talked before about her characterization in the comics and how maybe that was more of her past than her future in the show. And I think that this is going to be kind of a touchstone to future doings with Karen, maybe having somebody dig that up about her past. Yeah, we've been speculating about her past in the show, what it's actually going to be. I really, the whole season here, and you know, you don't get any insight into it, but I think we're going to go into it in season two. It's been teased way too much. And in this particular episode, you get the whole thing where she talks about her parents being religious and she is not because they were. And that opens the door into her past. We don't see any of it, but that starts to open the door a little bit. 
Yeah, my vote for Karen's past is uh, drugs and or porn. Certainly drugs, probably porn. I think I got the porn from somewhere. The comics. Yeah, she's a porn actress in the comics for a while there. Yeah. Or a prostitute or something. She's a bad girl. It was definitely something with sex work. (laughs) (laughs) Not that there's anything wrong with that. Hey, can we, before we go too much further, we were talking about the opening. I am on record hating that particular plot device where they start the show in the middle of the interesting part and then they jump back. I think it's a cheat. I think it's something they do to write around episodes that are slow or otherwise in need of some narrative help. So I don't like doing it that way. I don't like it. I think it's weak. I think it almost never works. That said, I think this worked. Yeah. And I also hate when superheroes or any character is in fake peril like it's the first commercial break and maybe the main character is going to die then you come back from commercial whoops they live oh except they're totally not because the show's named after them yeah like (laughs) oh wow big surprise so all that said i was watching the the multiple flashbacks as they kept getting gorier and gorier Uh and i thought well, okay, this is it. Daredevil's dead, and uh, somebody else is going to be Daredevil in the next four episodes, Foggy. I guess. Foggy's been Daredevil before. <laughs> well, he yeah. wants to be Captain America. <laughs> uh, have uh, Iron Fist be him again. <laughs> I took this plot device of the fight into be rounds of a boxing match, except for it's not a boxing oh, match. Oh, that's a good way of looking oh. at it. Yeah. So uh, he is taking a pounding, and we know it uh. takes a whole next episode to recoup. And he is getting pummeled. He is getting cut. He's getting stabbed. But he hangs in there and and Murdoch's don't quit. Oh, I don't think it's not so much cut as it is like ripped open. Yeah, I know. Ripped open. With it. And I was just going to get to that, especially when he was dragged across the floor. Ugh. So it also. Oh, God. It's making it's making like my skin hurt. <laughs> just thinking about it. Just, oh, God. OK. Ugh. So that is an important reason why you break it up as well, because if you have that whole fight in one block, it's just too much. Yeah, you know, that was in my notes, too. I mean, it's such a brutal fight that as much as I would have liked to see it go on all at once. I don't think I could have handled that whole thing. And I, I am the guy who likes the blood and the impact and the viscera. And it was not a fair fight after Nobu was burned at the stake or whatever you want to call it between Fisk and Daredevil, because Daredevil is just almost bleeding out there on the floor. And then Fisk wants to go after him. It's not a fair fight. Now, well, you know, he does have a considerable size advantage regardless. I was thinking about that. I don't think they're in the same weight class. No. What would you guess he weighs like closer to three than 250? (laughs) Closer to four if he's all muscle. I'm a I don't terrible, think he's all terrible judges. How tall is he? Do we know? I think he's right around six feet tall. Give me uh, like five seconds and I can pull up Vincent D'Onofrio's height on IMDb. He definitely seems like he's more than six feet. I think a lot of that's camera angles. Yeah, right, right. Six, three and a half. Wow. Okay, there you go. So yeah, I, I can see guy. him being, you know, he's got to be th- over 300. three, close to four. Yeah. And he's not the tubby kingpin. You know, he's certainly... You know, he's not chiseled for marble, but he is not portly. Right. And then it's doubly sad, this episode, which drives Daredevil to do what he does in the emotional outbreak, which Fisk actually counts on, is the death of Elena. And that is sad. It really affects Foggy and Karen. It really totally affects them. They're crying. Foggy gets wasted. And it's a good thing that the drinks are free because they tend to go to that bar a lot lately. They're totally not free. <laughs> yeah. Can we have a moment of silence for Mrs. Gardenas? I think that's a good idea. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Moment's over. She was good. She left us too soon. She had a full life. It's a thing on Tumblr. Precious cinnamon roll. Too good for this world. Too pure. Ew. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I love about this so much is that Daredevil's bad, 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 not just beating, but cutting and near gutting, leads in a very natural, organic, plausible way to the costume that he has. You know, he he doesn't have that costume, not for nothing, you know? Right. Well, he throws the knife at Kingpin in this episode and he sees the armor. I think this is the first time he's seen that body armor, yeah. right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. He's going to go after it in two episodes, because next yep. episode he's on the couch, and then he's going to go after Mr. Potter and figure out what the advantage is. Yeah. But, I mean, it makes sense in this universe that 
Daredevil would dress like that. He doesn't just show up like, I'm going to be a superhero and dress in this flashy, colorful way. Why not? You know, I'm a member of a couple of cosplay groups on Facebook, and a lot of people actually do it. Now, they might not have the advanced composite materials, but they can do a pretty good job. Yeah, look up the real-life superhero movement. I mean, they try. (laughs) But, of course, in this universe, Matt doesn't have that going on. Besides, he's blind. I see a lot of that ending, like, the first act of (laughs) Kick-Ass. Yeah, actually, seriously, if you want a good look at some of the real-life superhero stuff, look up Phoenix Jones. He's kind of the entry point if you want to read up on it. John Ronson's written a lot about him and some other real-life superheroes. I think there's some documentaries. It's kind of fascinating stuff. But these people, they don't tend to go after criminal masterminds like Kingpin. It's more... More walking around and doing neighborhood patrols. Yeah, walking around, breaking up fights, things like that. Yeah. So, also in this episode, we have that tremendous scene between Matt, Vanessa, and Fisk. Oh, that was so good. It was all over the map, too. It was great between the Vanessa actually describing the painting, the red painting to Matt, and then when Fisk comes in, and just the wordplay that's going back and forth the whole time, the double entendres, the double meanings. I don't think Fisk knows at this point in time that Matt is Daredevil. No, but he knows who Matt Murdock is, because obviously they hired him. Right. And then this is the first time that Matt has quote-unquote seen Fisk. Yeah, They've spoken over that walkie-talkie, but this is them basically sizing each other up, even if Fisk doesn't know that this is the lunatic in the mask. Mm -hmm. And when Vanessa says, here he is, I mean, Matt gets that very visible chill over him, like, oh, wasn't ready for this. Yeah, the oh crap look. (laughs) I was just barely able to censor myself in time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that whole scene was great. When he goes in and, and when Matt enters into the art gallery and he notices the what six security guys around the room and he knows and they're all packing yeah he knows he's gotta play it at a certain level not to get himself in trouble right and there were a lot of bald heads in that room (laughs) (laughs) absolutely especially when fisk was walking through the door and he's like flanked on either side by shorter balder men (laughs) (laughs) that's right and do you think Fisk knew that somebody was talking to Vanessa, and that's why he came? Or do you think he was on his way anyway? I think he was on his way anyway, and before I forget it, with regards to the shorter balder men, (laughs) Fisklings. So, there's that. There's the business sign, also in this episode. Yes! Avocados at law. (laughs) Avocados. Which, technically, you find out about next episode, but still. Right. It's coming. So, Haley, what was your favorite part of the episode? Uh, the montage of Matt beating the crap out of random guys on the street. Oh, yeah. Trying to find out where to go, who was responsible. And then he gets to the drug dealer and finally finds the information, which is planted about the warehouse on Pier 81. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it gets played a little bit there. Whoops. Yep. Good old Mr. Meth Mouth. I made that mistake yeah. once before with the Russians. I'm not going to make it again. He says as he makes the exact same mistake again. <laughs> Right. Lauren, what was your favorite part? Oh, definitely the priest conversation. Which one? The one about whether or not the devil exists. Okay, that's the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Ferris, what was your favorite part? You know, I'm on the fence about the fight. You know, as I talked about last time I was on, I do love a good kick-ass superhero fight, but this one seemed a lot choppier and choreographed and not as organic and one continual shot like it didn't feel like a real fight and so much if it was slow motion so i'm not going to say it's one of the lesser fights but i haven't made up my mind about it so what i will say is that my favorite part i think would go with uh you know to agree with lauren i'm gonna say the uh the priest not monologue but the priest dialogue with matt about the devil being the adversary and you know despite my sophomoric joking around before this episode really does have that theme of duality in the um, the show does, you know, I mean, this interpretation of the devil and God kind of has echoes in the relationship between Fisk being one force and Daredevil being another force. And I like how that plays into, you know, Matt's being conflicted, whether he is 
acting as the hand of God, or is he maybe overstepping his boundaries too much? So yeah, I think that introduces some really interesting themes that put the whole, you know, if not series, then certainly the first season into a pretty interesting perspective. Well, I was going to say, I think the priest pretty succinctly summed up Matt's conflict for the series, which this season, at least of it, which is, are you conflicted because you want to kill him and you don't have to, or because you have to kill him and you don't want to? Yeah, that was it exactly. There was, exactly. there was a couple moments like that in the show where it's just like, in this episode in particular, where you're just like, okay, that's it, that's the show, where it's Matt and Fisk, where they're saying, you know, I have exactly the same plan for Hell's Kitchen. It's just that they're going about it completely different ways. And then there's that conversation about what you've got to question what your real motive is. Right. And I think those two conversations are exactly what the theme of the show is. Yeah, oh, and then right. there was something else about uh, that Fisk says about emotions making him weak or something like that when he's talking about Matt and Miss Cardenas. And then you see that come into play with him later on with Vanessa. And it's an interesting contrast in that that Fisk probably does have conflicting reasons, some of them good, some of them selfish, for doing what he does, as does Murdoch, but Murdoch hasn't come to terms with them as much. He probably does not have the confidence in why he is doing what he does nearly as much as Fisk does. Well, it's this weird thing. It's, you know how they say that every villain thinks themselves the good guy? You see that here with Fisk, but then with Matt, it's kind of the inversion of he's a good guy, who thinks that he's, in some ways, the bad guy. Yeah. And right. you, it's not until, really, the last couple of episodes of the season that you see them really kind of fall into and accept their roles. That Fisk is like, oh, they want to make me the bad guy? Fine, I'll be the bad guy. And Matt's like, okay, you know what? I think I am the good guy. Right. Those scenes were great. The scenes with the priest, the scene with Fisk in the warehouse, where he's admitting what his weakness is like he can't focus and then he leads into the explanation of why and again no wasted dialogue the writers know exactly what they're doing here right but my favorite scene would definitely we talked about it already would be the art gallery that was just perfectly choreographed perfectly and i will say choreographed because the whole movement of matt into the art gallery and then fist coming in and then him having to retreat backwards and I will say retreat, because he retreats back to the chapel afterwards. I think the whole interaction with Vanessa, the whole interaction with Fisk, Vanessa describing the painting, basically describing Matt in his duality as well, that was just phenomenal to me. So the writers for this episode, we didn't say their names before, but Christos Gage and Ruth Yay. Fletcher Gage, obviously, looks like a husband-wife team. Yes. Yeah? They are. So, Christos Gage, I'm not sure what exactly his credits are movie-wise or TV-wise, but he's a writer for a bunch of comics that I really like. He did Avengers Academy. He did a bunch of Buffy the Vampire Slayer comics. He did the Avengers Initiative. Okay. World War Hulk. Well, some World War Hulk. He did some spinoffs of, he didn't write the comic proper. But yeah, he's written a bunch from, like, he gets Marvel. Mm-hmm. Well, he's listed as staff writer for all 13 episodes, but he is listed as prime on Speak of the Devil. So aside from that, his filmography is a lot of video games. There is a Tomb Raider TV series that I didn't know about in 2007 that he wrote, as well as Numbers, a couple of Law & Order episodes. So he's been dabbling for a while, but this was amazing. And Nelson McCormick was the director, so they did a phenomenal job. And definitely setting up probably two episodes from now, because next episode is largely, in my memory anyway, is the whole foggy mat thing going on, as well as some minor things going on outside of his apartment. So That's what I remember as well. Oh, before I forget, SP, I think it would be interesting to watch this episode another time, but I remember what you said earlier about viewing the flashbacks as more rounds in a boxing match, which made me think, if you took this entire episode as a boxing match because, you know, you mentioned with the advancing and retreating in the art gallery and his escaping kingpin and just things like that. I wonder, okay, I'm not nearly familiar enough with boxing to be able to kind of stretch the metaphor. Right. But I wonder if you could look at the movement of Fisk and Matt in this episode and just kind of compare and see if maybe there is some kind of boxing parallel there. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, as we discussed, it's such a slow episode, but Matt certainly does not kick a lot of ass in the episode. You know, he spends a lot of time thinking and stranding and, uh, well, he does in the montage. Yeah. Uh, going back and forth. And he is in true Murdoch fashion. And I start by when you came up with the boxing analogy, that gave me goosebumps. That I think was so astute. In true Murdoch fashion, in this episode, Matt is on the ropes all the way through the episode until the very end, but he does not quit. And when the bell rings, who won? Well, yeah, exactly. Did he necessarily win? I would say or, that he- Well, he did not lose. He didn't go down. He lived to fight another day. It was a stalemate. Yeah. It was a draw. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as Robert De Niro says in Raging Bull, you never got me down, Ray. You never got me down. <laughs> So, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't take him out, but he doesn't lose in the ultimate way either. Yeah, it's just another step down. But now he's actually confronted Fisk both as Matt and Daredevil. So he's got to deal with that and the repercussions. And he's also got to deal with the repercussions of becoming who he is and dealing with the people around him next episode. So I can't wait till next Tuesday when I watch it because I'll watch it the day before we podcast. So it's fresh in my mind when we podcast. You guys got anything else? Any major things that you want to say about the episode? I don't know if Haley has quotes, but we'll get to that next, too. I, of course I have quotes. Yeah, I think I covered everything I want to say. Okay, Ferris? Well, what, what do you guys think? At this point, do you think that Matt does want to kill Fisk or not? I think he hasn't decided. I think he wants him to be dead. I don't know if he wants him to kill him. If he wants to kill him. You know, I, I also, I liked... Foggy's monologue as well when he's a little bit drunk and he's talking about his and Matt's aspirations for equal representation and giving the common people a uh, real strong legal representation that you know only the kingpin can afford traditionally or the bigger people and he says well it's all bull crap just lies we tell ourselves to make it through another day you know I, I think that's a really interesting vision and if he's conflicted, you know, if he wants to do that, but he can't picture them realistically fighting with the larger forces, then how do you make them pay? I mean, maybe legal representation is not enough. Maybe you really do need somebody to go out and muscle them. And we'll see that come into play in the, uh, the conflict between Matt and Foggy and their philosophy very soon. Well, I think definitely the interaction between Daredevil and Fisk kind of seals that thought process for Matt. Matt's got to deal with his own humanity, but as Lauren said, tweeted during her live tweet, something about bacterial infection, I believe. Oh, yeah, no. Okay, this always bugs me whenever you see somebody and they're all sliced up or they're shot or something like that. And they jump into some filthy body of water. And from what I understand, <laughs> having never been there myself, the water in the industrial areas of New York City is notoriously filthy. I think Greg Proops always says it could choke a dolphin. <laughs> he has Rosario Dawson sewing him up, okay? Not yet, though. Not in the next episode. Superpowers. She has her own superpowers. <laughs> he almost doesn't make it to his apartment. Yeah, the biggest killer in the Civil War wasn't the actual fighting. It was infection. It was gangrene. And it doesn't matter if you stitch it up. You're still going to get Horrible things like salmonella and E. coli and Vibrio and who knows what else that's just going to rot you from the inside out. And it doesn't matter how fast you can jump and dodge because you can't dodge bacteria. Well, this is Matt Murdock, who was not doused, but certainly dosed with nuclear waste and came out of it in some ways enhanced. So he should also have cancer. I mean, <laughs> and Lauren, I will counter your argument by saying that Ant-Man can dodge bacteria. Only if he grows that small enough to go to the quantum realm and dodge stuff like that. Exactly. So it's possible. Ooh, it, it did make me really happy when he got that small. You see the tardigrades in there. And yeah, I was right. like, ooh, it's a water bear. <laughs> yeah, right. Again, with me in, in my deep dive on the comics, I'm getting to the point now where I've moved beyond the Frank Miller arc. And I'm starting to see how, in the comics at least, the foggy Murdoch relationship is a real long-term bromance. I mean, it goes through several cycles of up and down, and we're friends, and we're enemies, and I hate you, and we're rivals, and I need you, and we come back. And it's interesting to see how it's starting to play out here. And there's no end in sight for that. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that in any medium resolves quickly. You know, these are different guys 
with different ideas, but they're still friends and they need each other. And sometimes they need other things a little bit more, but there's a really strong friendship at the core here that survives things that most friendships and most friends would not survive. It's a heck of an episode, heck of a series. Can't wait till the next episode. Haley, let's do some quotes. I was always more studious than pious. <laughs> From the priest, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I could say I'm Captain America. That doesn't put wings on my head. <laughs> <laughs> Love that reference. Love it. Yeah. If Fisk really is the guy that blew the hell out of my city, shot those cops, and went after you, then nobody wants to see him take it on the nuts more than me. <laughs> Karen has a point. <laughs> right. Or, no, that was Foggy. But... That was Foggy that said it, and then she was like, uh, I might. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, because she's like, uh... Present company so remember, excluded. <laughs> remember that time that I almost died? Twice. Twice. I did a little back-channeling with Marcy. Ooh, ew, ew, <laughs> I don't want to know, ew. Gross. Ew. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh... I take it back. Foggy's my favorite part of this episode. Uh, <laughs> you know, Marcy's a good character. I mean, she is a sex pot, obviously, and she's blonde, but she is not insubstantial. They could have really uh, dumbed her down or dumbed her up in a bad way, but she is a formidable person, clearly. And the mere fact that she would see the upside of a guy like Foggy endears me to her. Yeah, well, because she's not a bad person. She just took advantage of an opportunity and... She's a Slytherin. She's yeah. ambitious. <laughs> Let her into some very dark gray areas. Which, by the way, if, uh, I don't remember if I brought this up before, but I saw something on Tumblr a long time back about, show me what an evil Hufflepuff looks like, and it was a picture of Wesley from this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Got any more, Haley? This last one's not really funny, but my mind, it won't quiet. I know. And just the way he did that with the hand around yeah. his head, it's like, yeah, we know. We've seen you get up in the middle of the night. We got it. The guy's a workaholic. You got to respect that. His mind's a bag of cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on treadmills. What? You mean fuzzy? <laughs> <laughs> you can smell the crazy on him. Just a little bit. Yeah, he needs to do some meth to uh, <laughs> taint the crazy. I think he needs to talk through some issues. Um. I think that's the opposite of what you right. need to do in that As situation. As someone who has met some people on meth, not a big problem solver. Yeah, no. <laughs> not very good for calming. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite. Also not great for dental hygiene. No. Oh, God. Meth mouth gross. <laughs> meth skin. The meth mouth, yeah, the, the meth itch. Where they just start, start to pick at themselves, and it is... Yeah, I know. Just, y'all, Google faces of meth, okay? Just not even once. <laughs> or better yet, don't. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on for a second here, and the individual who created this podcast, his name is Nightwing, we know him as John D., and he also has another podcast, the Legends Podcast. This past week was their fifth anniversary. So, if congratulations, you would, Yay! they're going to have to start looking for kindergartens. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, as something of a media guy, like there's nothing sadder to me than things that start off great guns, and it's going to be out every day, and then it's going to be out twice a month, maybe, and then every other month, and then. Within six months. Listen, I'm working on Crimson Comet, okay? And I'm work <laughs> working on the past episodes of this, so be quiet, but would I, you? I, but I mean, to keep something like that going for five years out of love, I mean, Wing is just a tremendous, dedicated guy with, you know, some of the most distinct taste that I've ever met, and I don't always agree with it, nor do I think it's wrong. So, uh, congratulations <laughs> on your ongoing success. You do your thing, you do it well, and I don't think anybody else could do it like you do. Yeah, there was a bunch of things about Legends Podcast that's important. First of all, it was one of the founding members of the Guna Geek Network. It was also, you will hear of a bunch of us that have been friends for a, a long time, you know, years and years. And Wing was the first one who brought forth a podcast from the rest of us now we uh, most of us come from one or two communities the fanboy buzz community or the galactic water cooler community and the fanboy buzz community is like steven and the gwc community came out of wing really a bunch of us started podcasting around it but wing was the first and that took a lot of guts and it's been going on for five years legend podcast and as ferris said before that that is just a long time so i just 
don't want to take too much time here, but it is a huge accomplishment. Two of us on this podcast know how much pain it is to edit a podcast every week. Wing's been doing it for five years. And yeah, you might... Do you really call what he does editing? Yeah, we talked about that on the <laughs> podcast. So go go listen to the podcast. We did it, The movie was phenomenal that we did, The Professional. I'd never seen it before. It's a, an amazing movie. Really? You've never oh, seen that you before? You've never seen it? No. I, I still haven't seen it. Oh! Sean brought it up for a lot of reasons. Shame. It's like the perfect movie for a Legends podcast because French director, French actor. It's got Transformers in it for Sean, and it had Natalie Portman in there for Sean. So, guess what? It's a great movie. Even though she's like 12 <laughs> at the time. I know. Ew. It might have been her first movie. I don't know. I think it was. What a creepy movie in an awesome I way. I love that movie so much. So there's that, and then there's the weekly news. And oh, by the way, stay tuned after the weekly news because you will hear some hilarious outtakes. So I'll just tease that. So go check that out. That's Legends Podcast. Are you guys ready to hear some news about some weekly comics here? Yay! Ready. <laughs> So, S.H.I.E.L.D. number eight came out last week. I haven't had a chance to read it. I plan to read it on the plane tomorrow. Yes, I am leaving on a jet plane. <laughs> See what I did Don't there? know when, when you'll, you'll be back, back again. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sad that the movie that I know that from is Armageddon. Armageddon. Yeah, so go figure. Yes. Anyway. That's a fun movie, Dan. I like it. I like it. I love it. My rocket scientist husband spits fire every time it's on he just hates it so much no if you do not like armageddon you do not deserve entertainment come on what oh you don't like i, I got no, if you don't like armageddon yeah, you don't deserve I did entertainment get confused. yes because yeah. I, I have my hand on the button i have my hand on the button and perhaps i mean i i know both of you to be people of taste so perhaps your your husband as a scientist has some uh Objects to it on factual grounds. But he'll watch Independence Day. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like, <laughs> what's the difference? Get it together, come on. I love crappy science movies. But if you can watch that, I don't want to give away spoilers, but if you can watch the parting scene between AJ and Bruce Willis without crying, you are dead inside and probably have been the entire time. He also doesn't like Disney, so yes, he is dead inside. He doesn't like Muppets either. <sighs> What, is he some kind of communist? <laughs> must be, must be. All right. So anyway, I am looking forward to catching up on some comics on the plane tomorrow. But guess what? Adam has been keeping track of the S.H.I.E.L.D. issues, and he's got a little recap of number eight for us. So here we go. This is Consultant Black Adam with your mission report for S.H.I.E.L.D. issue eight. In this issue, Coulson and May team up with Mockingbird to take down an organization that is surgically altering children and selling them as slaves. This case seems pretty personal for Mockingbird, but I don't know enough about her history in the comics to know why. Lola also makes an appearance and is used to help interrogate a suspect when they take him for a ride, then flip the car without fastening his seatbelt. He gives them information they need for Mockingbird and May to infiltrate the abandoned hospital where the surgeries are performed while Coulson tracks down the buyers. As I said, I think this would have had more of an impact if I knew more about Mockingbird's backstory. While this was a good story, it seemed a bit rushed, and it would have been nice to have it split across two issues instead of crammed into one. And now for the news for the S.H.I.E.L.D. comic. S.H.I.E.L.D. issue 9 will release on August 19th, and it is an oversized anniversary issue. It spans the past and the present and unites Phil Coulson and Nick Fury Sr., the white David Hasselhoff one, in a unique cross-time adventure to answer a riddle that it lies at the heart of the origins of S.H.I.E.L.D. Who is the man called Death? Plus, the return of Dum Dum Dugan and the birth of the new Howling Commandos, the very first S.H.I.E.L.D. story from 1965, and the pilot presentation sequence that inspired the creation of S.H.I.E.L.D. September will have new S.H.I.E.L.D. comics every week with one-shots for various characters. I'll go over most of them in my next mission report, but Mockingbird S.H.I.E.L.D. 50th Anniversary No. 1 releases on September 2nd. Mockingbird has always been one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s best agents, but what happens when someone close to her is murdered? Forced to take matters into her own hands, someone is bound to pay. I'll see you next month for my next mission report. 
Woohoo! Did you hear that? David Hasselhoff is going to be in Marvel Comics. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Adam, thank you very much for that rundown. Really appreciate it and can't wait to some of those coming up. You guys have anything to say about Shield number eight? So I was looking through Mockingbird's biography on Comic Vine just now, and there's nothing about child slavery or anything mentioned. So I'm wondering if it, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she escaped the Red Room. Well, there's a whole lot about her. Well, for a while there, she was kidnapped by Skrulls. And then for a while there, I mean, I guess spoilers for something that happened like almost 10 years ago now. Hey, wait, but wait a minute. That's like 30 years from where Haley is. Exactly. So Spoilers. spoilers. <laughs> she was resurrected by the Grim Reaper to serve him against the Avengers. And she does have a history of people like using her against other people, against her will. So I'm wondering if maybe something like that. I don't mm-hmm. know. We'll see. It'd be fun to find out, right? I'll have to read the issue. Yeah. So. Yeah, I have to do it. All right, and as always, Neil pipes in with his weekly Marvel moment. Hi, agents. Neil here with your Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Marvel moment covering new releases from July 29th, 2015. There's just a handful of new books out from Marvel this week, so what are we waiting for? Let's get into it. Kicking off the pre-Secret Wars books this week is Black Widow number 20 by writer Nathan Edmondson with art by Phil Notto. This team has worked on Black Widow longer than any other creative team, and their love of this character definitely shows. This book happens almost exclusively in flashback as we look back into Natasha's days as a KGB agent. It's a great issue that could stand alone, but I'm betting that collected in trade format it will form a critical piece of the mosaic that makes Natasha such a great character. Guardians team up number eight gives us Groot and Silver Surfer in an absolutely gorgeous issue that revolves around the two heroes breaking into the middle of two warring armadas on a mysterious quest. While I'm still not used to Groot's new look following the Black Vortex events, the visual storytelling in this issue was off the wall, which is good, because it's basically an issue with no words. While some readers have found the ubiquitous starfields in the backgrounds distracting, I felt that it gave the images an incredible sense of depth, which really made it feel like it was set in deep space. Daredevil number 17 also came out this week, and it was a fantastic issue. The story actually had my pulse racing and the portrayals of some of the classic Daredevil characters as well as some of the older and underused Avengers characters was spot on. Writer Mark Wade's Kingpin was awesome to behold as Fisk wielded power, fear and intimidation as only he can. Unfortunately, this is the penultimate issue in the current run of Daredevil and I don't want it to stop. Deathlock number 10 picks up in the aftermath of the current Deathlock Henry Hayes having taken down the evil biotech corporation with the help of former Deathlock Michael Collins, Domino, and S.H.I.E.L.D. Mike Perkins' art and Andy Troy's colors continue to shine, and while the story has been captivating, the title has struggled commercially. Deathlock's niche popularity, despite his role in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., has meant that it won't be coming back after this run. Speaking of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this week Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. number 8 also dropped, but I'll let consultant Adam bring you up to speed on what happened there. Now, let's dive back into Secret Wars. Age of Ultron vs. Marvel Zombies number 2 continues to look at the adventures of the 1872 version of Hank Pym beyond the S.H.I.E.L.D. wall as he is taken into Sanctuary by three characters tied to Ultron's past. The Vision, the original Android Human Torch, and Simon Williams aka Wonder Man in all of his red safari jacket awesomeness. For what I honestly thought was going to be a title that I wouldn't be interested in, I'm really surprised by the depth of the story and some of the twists and turns that it's taken. In my opinion, issue 2 is even better than the first and it leaves off by setting up the ultimate unholy alliance. Deadpool's Secret Secret Wars number 3 continues Deadpool's look back at what really happened in 1984's original Secret Wars as only Deadpool can. From ACDC lyrics to a look at what happened before Spidey got his iconic black costume, this title continues the tongue-in-cheek wackiness as only a Deadpool title can. One bit of warning though, it does jump around a bit, so if you haven't read the original Secret Wars, you might get lost, especially because of the unconventional naming of the flashback sequences. Speaking of lighthearted fun, Modoc Assassin number 3 teams up everyone's favorite mental organism designed only for killing with Angela from the Thors in a non-stop fight against an endless stream of assassins, including some great C and D-list villains hired by the Assassin's Guild. It's another fun title that fits nicely into the Secret Wars continuity without taking itself too seriously. 
If you're looking for more Angela, then look no further than 1602 Witch Hunter Angela number 2, which continues the story of Sarah and Angela as they search for the Enchantress's Faustians in Marvel's version of Shakespearean England. This issue finds Sarah and Angela teaming up with the 1602 versions of the Guardians of the Galaxy, and as usual, there's a great take on the familiar characters that places them firmly in this corner of Battleworld. The use of the traveling theater company trope from period literature also works really well within the framework of this story, and I can't wait for the next issue. And finally, my pick of the week for this week is Thor's number two, from writer Jason Aaron with pencils by Chris Sprouse and Goran Suzuka. Issue number two continues the police procedural format with the Thors dealing with the loss of one of their own. Familiar themes such as the wake at the cop bar, visits to the forensics lab, and cops pulling out all the stops as they try to round up potential suspects feel right at home in this issue and definitely don't pull you out of the story. Moreover, the artistic team does a great job at conveying how impactful the loss of a colleague was on the entire force. The cameos scattered throughout the story continue to feel organic and not forced, and I'm definitely going to be sad to see this title inevitably end when Secret Wars wraps up. That's it for new releases, now let's dive into the long boxes where we crack open the Mylar and take a look at a classic back issue. My long box pick for this week is Daredevil issues 29, 30, and 31 from Volume 2 released in March 2002, with story by the incredible Brian Michael Bendis. This week's pick were actually inspired by the recent discussions on the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast about the character of Vanessa. These issues are the fourth, fifth, and sixth book, respectively, in Bendis' Underboss storyline, which covers a power struggle in the Kingpin's organizations and its repercussions. The events leading up to it are told in flashback, and we get a deep look into not only how the rest of the Kingpin's empire deals with absolute power at the top, but how Fisk interacts with traditional mafia crime families in other parts of the US. Most importantly, we get to see a level of commitment that Vanessa has for Wilson, and it's these images that have stayed with me since I first read these books. Again, that's issues 29 through 31 of Daredevil, Volume 2, from 2002. That's it for this week, folks. If I've missed a release that came out, head over to the forums and share your thoughts, or send in a voicemail to the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. crew. Later, guys! Wow. Yay. Neil, you continue to amaze me, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, Adam. Really appreciate it. Did you guys catch anything in there that you want to talk about? There was the Thors, too. I really like hearing that about the uh, cop tropes. I'm a huge fan of cop shows. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one that I'm going to have to check out when it gets collected. Yeah. I'm going to check it out, too, soon. <laughs> yeah. And then... And of course, uh, I think that I have those issues of Daredevil on my iPad, and I'm like 95% sure I have this. So I'll be looking for those in that arc in particular when I get to that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't wait till I actually get to some of this stuff. But for <laughs> now, just uh, have to listen to what he has to say on the weekly basis and go from there. Well, that's it for the comic news. Oh, one last thing, Ferris. Yes. I have taken your advice, and I have taken Neil's advice, and I am now a Marvel Unlimited subscriber. How's that working out for you? There is a lot of crap out there, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I what's funny reading? is they don't even have everything. No, yeah. I know, I know. I've been looking for stuff that's applicable to Ant-Man, that's applicable to the Avengers, applicable to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and it's just, there's just so much out there. It's like, okay, well, I'll just pick something and and start reading it, and it's just a sea of stuff. Have you done one of the curated deep dives where they kind of collect? You know, I was starting to look into that. It takes some getting used to to navigate, so I was just clicking on random stuff and opening stuff when I finally got to it, and then just taking a quick look at it and whatever, but I am definitely planning to do one of those curated dives, because as much as I want to start in 1963, I just don't think that's going to be possible. But Actually, you could start in 1939 if you wanted to. I could help you out with that, too. Oh, my gosh. No, that's, <laughs> that's, that's fine. But thank you for okay. recommending it. I did take the Penny Ant-Man deal for the first month, so that was cool. How could you not? Yes, exactly. It was like, yeah, it's too good.
Yeah, I mean that. I'm swear I'm not a paid spokesperson. Although tonight's appearance is fueled by Michelob Ultra and Marvel <laughs> Unlimited, uh, I'm not a paid spokesperson. I'm Marvel Unlimited is just amazing. Having a good ninety, ninety-five percent of everything Marvel has ever done at your fingertips. It's a lot of good nighttime reading, you know. Yeah, definitely is. All right, you guys ready to get into some news? News. Yay! Let's do news. it. This week's highlight story of the week. I think there are a couple people on this podcast that would like this story. <laughs> Haley Atwell thinks Captain America and Peggy Carter had sex. Yay! I disagree, <laughs> yeah. but okay. I'm just picturing that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's been plenty of fanfic out there already, but there uh, has been. Yeah. So you can go check that out if you want. And then also, we have an added actor to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Constance Zimmer. Who she was I, on the newsroom. Really? Who was yeah. she? She was the Mitt Romney's press liaison or whatever. Oh, her! Okay, yeah. yeah I liked her. Her. <laughs> yeah. So she is confirmed as going to be a recurring role on season three. So we're excited about that. I like her because everything I've seen her in, she's snarky. Yes. Well, it wasn't everybody on the newsroom snarky. Well, yeah, that's Aaron Sorkin has that effect on people. Some were better than and more tolerable than others. <laughs> <laughs> and not to get too far off track, but if we're going to talk the newsroom, let's jump ahead to some X Men news. And of course, Olivia Munn looks like a badass. Let's talk about that. She does. <laughs> Have you seen this video that yes, she tweeted several times? Yes. yes. It was on like a continual playback for me. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that's her. Oh, my gosh, that's her. She looks like she's going to be doing all her own stunts like big time. That's awesome. I bet she's not, but it's going to look good <laughs> when she does. Yeah, she's probably not, but still amazing. Olivia Munn. <sighs> awesome. You'd let her kick you in the face, wouldn't you? I would several times. I think Operator would let her kick him all day. <laughs> you know, speaking of X-Men, this is we talk about it all the time. What a golden age we're living in. Last night, as I was flipping through the channels, I there were six good superhero movies on cable last night, nice. just in like the HBO through stars bracket. There might have been more on basic cable. As we're speaking right now, one, two, three, four, what comes after four or five? No, four <laughs> uh, are on right now. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Not to, I mean, and that's strictly superhero stuff. Not to mention Walking Dead and various genre sci-fi stuff on cable. It's just constantly around the clock. Last night, two X-Men movies were on at, at some point. And tonight, two more are. <laughs> it's great. It's wonderful. I, I love it. It's just, whew, we're in the golden age of comic book television and movies on the screen. It's just geek television and movies in general. It's amazing. It's great, isn't it? I know. Yes. We need more sci-fi. We need more sci-fi. I've been saying that mantra for years, and guess what? We've got it now. <laughs> we do. We had 12 Monkeys, Defiance. Are you caught up on uh, Falling Skies? I am. I'm all the way caught up with that. I think I'm one behind. I stopped watching in the first season. <laughs> I'll say it. I'm glad that show is ending. I, okay. We'll talk about that more later. I don't yeah. want to take okay. us all night, but we, it should be talked about. I okay. do I do enjoy it, and I am enjoying The Last Ship. I'm enjoying Dark Matters. I'm enjoying Killjoys, which I didn't think I was going to, and I just can't wait for The Expanse later on this year, or early next year it's on Sci-Fi. So Sci-Fi is starting to redeem itself, but there was still Sharknado 3 on, so quit that. Stop it. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> Gotta pay the bills. They make so much money off of those Sharknado movies, though, because it costs them nothing at all to make. Yeah, it costs them absolutely nothing, and people want to be in it because they're ridiculous, so <laughs> it's, like, easy as hell for them to get cast. So. Yeah, I know. I, d I haven't watched a single one, okay. but I no, saw Tara Reid. I, so. I saw the okay, first well, one, wait, wait. and I regret every second of no, it. No, 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 no. The first one's the worst one. <laughs> Somehow, inexplicably, they keep getting better. Well, it would be hard to get worse. Like, the third one was actually, like, a, a lot of fun, and George R. R. Martin got eaten by a shark. <laughs> and I'm not going to defend my weird affection for Sharknado in any way, shape, or form. Because, like, again, speaking of bad science, there's some seriously, <laughs> seriously terrible <laughs> ichthyology in that movie, y'all. But Wait, you mean sharks can't survive in a tornado? 
And they're not ravenously hungry all the time and just waiting to feed what? on the flesh of the living. Yeah, I know. Madness. But I kind of like these movies. So my son Sandrock is actually going to North Carolina and well, yeah, he's, he's going to get eaten by yeah, a Sharknado. He, he <laughs> is because he's going to be right on the beach. I mean, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. <laughs> Either that or the tidal wave from that other asteroid movie that came in and took out the East Coast. <laughs> I need to get him a motorcycle so he can climb those hills. Yeah. Save <laughs> so himself. So he can outrun the tidal wave. I know. It's so cool. All right. So moving on with our news. And we said that we were going to have Lauren talk a little bit about this subject last week when she came back. And we're going to Lauren Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones! <laughs> okay. So oh, I was getting ready to fall asleep the other night. And I was feeling kind of bad because I was just come back from a trip and I wasn't feeling all that great. And then I had to check Twitter. And I saw that Netflix has released the official Jessica Jones logo, and I started screaming and had to retweet it, and it was fantastic. So, the Jessica Jones logo exists, and it exists. It's gray. It has lines. It's, <laughs> it's actually the happening. Words Jessica Jones. It's the words Jessica Jones. I mean, it's real. Not AKA either. <laughs> and then last yeah. week, we also went over the news item that said that Jessica Jones will indeed be out in 2015. There was no actual yes. release date, but it will be out in 2015. So late November, December, we're thinking. And that also none of or all of the single series will go before they do de the Defenders. So I don't know when the Defenders will go, but they're talking about every six months ish between releases of the Netflix series. So and Daredevil is obviously going to have a season two before right. the Defenders. So you're talking at least, uh, what, 18, 24 months from now from the Defenders. I will gladly wait if they're going to keep feeding me. Basically, yes. Tangent from there, it's, what is the current status of the Night Nurse? Is Rosario Dawson or is she not? Well, so something that's not in the news, Rachel McAdams, I heard, is in supposedly in talks to be somebody in Doctor Strange. And rumor has it, that she's going to be the actual character of Night Nurse. But why? Again, it's, I know it's all rumors. I don't know. We'll see. But for now, Claire yeah, Temple will Claire be Temple in Jessica Jones. Is though. my Night Nurse. Yeah. I did not say it all suggestive. <laughs> <laughs> I would not mind if I said it at all suggestively. Yeah. Well, Rosario Dawson is been confirmed to be in Jessica Jones. Which is what we theorized. Excellent. Yeah. She, I mean, she doesn't have to be the night nurse as long as she's in every show as much as possible. That's fine. Yes. That's cool. Right. We've been theorizing that she'll be the connective tissue through all these shows anyways. And that and seems right. to be holding true. Yes. Right. I'm perfectly all right with this. They were like, hey, we've got Rosario Dawson. Why don't we put her in everything? <laughs> And I'm like, yes, Marvel, why don't you continue having good ideas like that? Think of the contract. Yes, we need to sign you for 20 separate appearances. We're going to sign you for 100 episodes of television. <laughs> of television. And oh, by the way, there's Netflix over here, which you're contractually obligated for. In addition to the 100 episodes of television, which we'll be doing on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, whatever. So, Well, probably oh, not yeah. Agent Carter. Just, just have her travel through time and then she can meet, exactly. then she can meet Peggy. There you I go. Think I would Great. rather have Peggy travel through time and then okay, she can yeah. meet everybody. Why can't we do both? And Rosario okay. Dawson can go back in time and have sex with Steve Rogers. Why? Maybe no. before he becomes Captain Everyone America. Everyone knows that Steve Rogers doesn't get laid. Yeah. The dude deserves to she get makes laid. Love. <laughs> yeah, there she you makes go. Sweet, sweet love. Okay, yes, that's true. Steve Rogers doesn't <laughs> frack, he makes sweet love. And now probably while listening to Marvin Gaye. Oh. Yes, exactly right. See, he totally suggested that Sam Wilson listen to Marvin Gaye. So, yeah, that's I'm just true. Gonna shut up. <laughs> Sharon Carter for the win. All right, <laughs> talking about Sharon Carter, we're going to be talking about Civil War. What do we got going on, guys? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> They're doing it. I'm so happy. I'm so happy <laughs> to be alive in this age and to see these comic stories told on the movie screen. Good. <laughs> I'm just so happy. Just got a fair screen. I know. <laughs> no, it's just. It's Fair is crying. Have another beer, man. I'm very clamped. <laughs> okay, so we got some Marvel actors on the set, right? And we've got yes. a Spider Man cameo that's been shot, and we've got a bunch of other stuff going on. 
yes, everything is coming together and everything is happy and it's sunshine and rainbows. And Sebastian Stan looks vaguely like a homeless person and it's wonderful. <laughs> it looks like he stole Stephen Amell's wig and hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and when I think of that wig, I think of the Stephen Amell like young kid acting. Like, come on, yeah, guys! It, that, that is a tr- I love that show, but that is a truly tragic wig. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but you can't have the salmon ladder without the wig. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> uh, if uh, Adam in the chat said if Chris Pratt was in it, you could say that everything was awesome. That's true. And we, yeah, who knows? Maybe he is going to be in it. We'll see. Probably not, though, because you got the Infinity Gauntlet coming up. And supposedly the Spider-Man cameo has been shot. So we have an article linking to that. Since now that we have a Peter Parker, we have a Spider-Man. Look, there goes Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Mark Ruffalo, despite saying, I'm not going to be in Civil War. I don't know why he's you're talking totally about this. He's totally in Civil War. He's totally in Civil War because he's hanging out at a club in Berlin with the rest of the Avengers cast. So either he just really like misses them or he's in the movie. Uh, he might just be there for craft services. You don't know. Or to, I mean, yeah. I don't know, but it's like I sort of know. Or maybe you know? he's trying to beef up and he needs to be around the Chris's and RDJ as they're working out 12, 14 hours a day. I think he's in it. I think everybody's in it. (laughs) Yeah. Right. All right. So we already talked about Olivia Munn. And now we have to talk about the Channing Tatum and Gambit. He's going to Channing all over your Tatum. (laughs) That was a saga (laughs) that happened. horrifically vulgar. (laughs) That was a song. (laughs) For a minute there, I was hoping he would go through with it and not be in the movie. Just because I want them to cast Ricky Jay, who can throw cards like nobody's business. I don't know who you're talking about. Me either. There's been a bunch of talk about not, just not wanting Channing Tatum in the movie because... Remember the day and a half where he was totally walking away and then yeah. it was like, oh, the contract's officially signed. Yeah, there See, you go. I want Channing Tatum as Gambit for two reasons. One, I want him to take off his clothes in a Marvel movie. Right. And two, his Cajun accent is really funny. <laughs> Jay, sorry, <laughs> and, like, man. <laughs> yeah. So my dream for a Gambit movie is to have Gambit talk like one of the guys from Swamp People. <laughs> 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 and it's not his Cajun accent isn't like that, but it is very Cajun. Is he going to have his teeth too, or not? That is optional. <laughs> but I mean, okay, if he's going to be taking his clothes off, he either needs to have all of his teeth, or he needs to keep his mouth shut. All right. In there which you go. case, you wouldn't get the Cajun accent. You can do it, Gambit. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so funny story about the Water Boy. It became a. Uh, I, this is completely off topic, but I, I we don't do that sort of thing here. Feel the need to share this anytime the Water Boy is brought up. When I was in band in high school, we had just won our first UIL Straight Ones competition. It's we're all very happy, and we're driving over to get food from a nearby town. And a friend of mine has just borrowed another friend's tape of the Water Boy that was recorded off the pay per view, so that they could watch it on the <laughs> bus going over. Oh, remember when we did that kind of stuff? Yeah. So we get there and my friend is in huge trouble and the bus, the assistant band director is yelling at him and we're like, what the hell happened? So what had happened was that while he had been recording it, he'd gotten called out of the room for a few minutes and our other friend who was there changed the channels for a second and started recording lesbian porn. (laughs) Just a bit of it. And then switched back over. (laughs) And then, so at some point early in the movie, it switches from the water boy to lesbian porn and in a panic the assistant band director didn't shut off the movie he started fast forwarding so it was just really really speedy lesbian porn so the water boy became slang for lesbian porn for like the rest of my high school career oh nice anyway and i feel like fast forwarding lesbian porn leads in nicely to the deadpool trailer <laughs> Just a that bit. is actually true. <laughs> the trailer for the trailer, the red band trailer, and the green band trailer. Well Which done. Which you should yes. watch exactly once before <laughs> repeatedly watching the red band trailer. Yeah. Seriously, I don't. I haven't even watched the green band trailer yet. I would. I would draw. Uh, if you haven't seen the red band trailer, I would watch the green band trailer, and then I would watch the red band trailer just so you know how they did it because. <laughs> They actually changed at least one scene, if not two. But Well, there are several scenes where they're cut slightly different, and there's a few seconds of footage in the Green Band trailer that aren't in the Red Band trailer. 
Okay, so what you're saying is I will have to watch it at least once. Just once. Just the once. And then you can watch the Red Band trailer over and over again. But the Red Band trailer is amazing. Yes, it is. And you know what? The trailer, I'm I'm a total spoiler phobe, and I try not to watch trailers for movies that I'm interested in. But I checked out the Deadpool one, and it shows a lot, but it doesn't give away hardly anything about the plot. It doesn't look like the action is from later in the movie, so... uh no, this all looks like early stuff. You can check it out without ruining yourself. So, Ferris, have you seen the Star <laughs> Wars trailer? No, 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 no. Uh, Which gives away absolutely nothing. Nah, still. I mean, if it's one image, that's too much for me. <laughs> Coming up to episode one for years. How are you on the internet and not seeing an image about Star Wars? It's like a whole different set of reflexes. You got to <laughs> learn to look sideways out of the corner of your eye and this and that and the other thing. This is what sent me over the edge. Leading up to episode one for years and years and years, no spoilers, nothing. I avoided everything, didn't read anything. A week beforehand, I go to Pizza Hut and I buy a pizza. And there on the box is Lord Sidious, or Lord Sidious, the Emperor. <laughs> Spoiler, I totally hadn't even thought the Emperor would be in it. So I buy a damn pizza. And the pizza box ruins me. So this time, I can't be too careful with this. You know, I'm not buying no pizza, no nothing. You can't go to uh, fast food restaurants because they'll have the glasses like they did in the old days. Yeah. And no, he's luck. having ramen noodles delivered to his house and the packaging gonna, removed before it enters You're going to turn into Howard Hughes for the next six months. He's just been peeing in jars. I'm, I'm walking through the world like Mr. Magoo without my glasses, no nothing, just stumbling around and feeling my way. And if something feels like Jar Jar Binks, I'm going to run the other way. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually probably good advice. Right. You know, everyday life anyway. BB-88. <gasps> no, sir, stay. <laughs> All right. Talking about wonderful things in movies again, like Jar Jar Binks, let's talk a little bit about the Fantastic Four, Haley. Okay, so Michael B. Jordan and Kate Mara, who are playing Johnny and Sue Storm, did an interview, and it's the worst. I watched a minute of it before I had to turn it off because I wanted to vomit. I think Lauren's seen the whole thing, though. I have not seen the whole thing okay. because also... Well, not because of, of what they were saying and not because of them being bad, right? No, because of the questions being asked and the... Uh. It is, like, literally the worst. It's just, wow. Uh. Like, it's, I mean, terrible questions are being asked. Now, this is... I, I didn't watch it yet, but you were saying it's on, like, a morning zoo, basically. I, They're being interviewed uh, by a couple ignorant yeah, DJs uh, or that sort of thing. The Atlanta Rocks 100.5, Stephen J. Rickmans and Jason Bailey were just being complete and utter. Banger like, in the douche. Yeah, basically, yes. And actually, uh, at the bottom of this article, there's a gift from that Parks and Recreation episode. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just that they're being terrible and asking terrible questions. Like, they're not even asking them well. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. Don't watch this. It's uncomfortable. It's gross. It's irritating. So for the record, Michael B. Jordan can do anything he wants to. Can right. we all just agree on that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I won't be watching this. So instead of watching that, you should go watch Dub Smash videos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Brett Dalton did one and it's amazing. <laughs> we talked about this last time, Lauren, and Jay posted a story link in the last podcast with all of them in sequential I order, and they were keeping them. up with it. But this has just been fun. And Haley Atwell and Clark Gregg are, of course, kind of the team captains going back and forth, pretty much. Yeah. And yeah. what she does to Brett Dalton here is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> I just, every, I love following this cast Twitter account. And Haley Atwell just has, like, the best, like, ha-ha smile. Where right here she's uh, just taking a picture and hugging Brett Dalton and has pasted a little sticker on his back that says Dub Smash Loser 2015. <laughs> oh, Brett Dalton. Just, oh, man. I just, the real winners here are us. Can we not agree on that? Oh, absolutely. This but, cast is true. great. They are. It, it, I think they were cast for their ability to do this sort of stuff, to interact with the fans. and Yeah. So we agreed a long time ago that Marvel just kind of raises them in a little hatchery until <laughs> such time as they are available to go out into the world, right? Yeah, or, and the hatchery obviously is in Asia, because you know, that's where Chloe came from, so there you go. <laughs> Brett Dalton is so pretty. 
<laughs> and, and we hate him so much. <laughs> we hate him, but he's pretty. <laughs> yeah, right. And he plays it up. We have heard a couple of uh, convention panels with him after the reveal came out, after Winter Soldier came out, and uh, he's definitely having fun with it. So, good on him there. Okay, now talking a little bit about the broader Marvel, we have possibly- You know what? Sorry, you mentioned Winter Soldier. <laughs> you know what the Deadpool trailer reminded me of? Like the biggest, goriest scene? It reminded me of the Winter Soldier shootout on the bridge, but with blood. Yes. So if you're on the fence about whether or not to watch it, imagine like a Winter Soldier level of action intensity, but with actual gore to it. That's what the Deadpool trailer is like. Actually, it looked like the same bridge. I mean, it might have been the same place. Who knows? Yeah, they just like, hey, can we borrow this again? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. Bye. So sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Netflix is considering Thunderbolts. What do we got going on there? It's just rumors at this point. Ah, the rumors. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's rumors that Netflix is considering Thunderbolts, which for those of you who don't know, Thunderbolts is the team of kind of the bad guys, like Marvel's answer to Suicide Squad, who are they're the bad guys that are doing good. Since and the picture they're showing here, which is from the comics, I believe, is Electra, Red Hulk, Punisher, and so far, two of these characters are getting ready to be introduced in the show. I don't know the comic well. Like, does the comic have a relatively stable lineup? I mean, is there like an iconic central member to it? No, it's the comic's been going for a while, but it's been for a while there. Norman Osborn was in charge of the Thunderbolts, and that kind of was what led into Dark, Dark Rain. Avengers. Yeah. And then uh, for a while there, Luke Cage was oh. not leading them, but like in charge of them, making sure they didn't mess up. You can't just say Luke Cage mm. like that. <laughs> Luke Cage was leading them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we don't have a science baby, so might as well get that Luke Cage in there. Yeah. But I mean, are there any like heroes that are synonymous or anti-heroes or villains? Like, Not really, I guess. No. Maybe Red Hulk or Electro would be the closest. General Thunderbolt Ross. Yeah. But I mean, conceivably, Punisher and Electro fit in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. All right, and then also, Lauren happened to find <laughs> the Guardians of the Galaxy animated trailer. Yes, Disney XD has a Guardians of the Galaxy animated series upcoming, and it is very much inspired by the movie. It even has in the trailer Hooked on a Feeling, and the character designs are very much more the movie-verse inspired rather than the comics. And it has a good voice cast. The trailer looks like a lot of fun. I'm going to be watching it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Their animated shows are pretty fun. No overlap with the movie voice cast? No, sadly, but uh, I'll have to double check. But I mean, they're clearly taking their cues from the movie. Yeah. I, I heard Vin Diesel's going to be back. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's probably Fred Tadjassior. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay, and then rounding out our news, this is not Stargate Pioneer approved, but for Lauren... Programmer builds a Pacific Rim style robot out of Legos. So Yes. That is for you. It's a little special bonus yes. coda. Yes. All right. Are you guys ready to get some feedback? Let's sure listen thing. to what people have to say. Lay it on me. Richard tweeted us with some news. Thank you, Richard. And he can be found at Kodiak GWC. We really appreciate you chiming in, buddy. And uh, Old school. Yeah, get some io9 news in here about a totally bonkers rumor about the villains in the new Spider-Man reboot. So if you're into spoilers on Spider-Man, go check that out on io9. And then I got a direct message on Twitter from Andy Migna, our friend from abroad. And he said, after much deliberation, my guess for The Force Awakens worldwide box office is, and he's got some exact numbers here, and it yeah. is in U.S. dollars, so he must have done some sort of conversion, $2,240,842,000, or thou no, I'm sorry, what is this? I don't know. I think there's a zero missing. Okay, so- And I think there's periods instead of commas. Okay. So we'll go with two billion two hundred forty million eight hundred and forty two thousand two hundred and seventy dollars. And if that's wrong, get back with me, Andy. Send in a correction. 
That is a lot of money. Lot of money. Do you guys think it's going to break $2 billion? Yes. Ooh. I'm going to go see it a lot, so. If anything will. I still am. It's in the holiday time span. Well, I guess the, Avatar was. He said $2.2 billion. Avatar was $2.7 billion worldwide. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah, certainly. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Certainly. And when was, how many years ago was Avatar at this point? Too many. Several. I don't remember years. So, I mean, you figure in the inflation, I mean, like, movies are probably, like, at least $5 more than they were, even if it was a couple years ago. See, I bring that up all the time. Give me ticket sales, because, you know, a 3D ticket nowadays can go for 20 25 bucks if you see yeah. it on the weekend, whatever. And, no, I... We are cheapos on this podcast. I saw Ant Man at five dollars. Haley got away with three dollars, and yeah, you know. so did I. But I mean, the five dollar theater where I live is very Art Deco, and you know, it's they're good people too. But yeah, you can spend a lot of money going to the movies. You, if you bring somebody, if you buy popcorn and soda, it's easily a fifty dollar bill. Do you think the Star Wars crowd is going to want to see it on a good screen more than once? Yes. Yeah, I'll pay the bucks to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But again, you got to go for ticket sales because I keep hearing stories about the original Star Wars coming out in 1978, right? 78, did I get that right? Or is it 77? One of the two. 77. 77. Okay. So Star Wars came out in 1977 and I keep hearing stories about people that over that summer kept going back to the theater over and over and their parents would just bring them to the mall for the afternoon or whatever and they would go see the movie over and over and over again. So... People just don't do that in this day and age. Movies don't stay in the theaters that long to see them over and over and over. But if the ticket prices back then were what they are now, what would have Star Wars A New Hope been? I mean, are we talking $5 billion? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the whole box office take is a ridiculous scam of a way to to metric it out. But what are you going to do? In case you care, domestic adjusted for inflation, gone with the wind is number one. In modern dollars, it will be $1.6 billion domestic. Wow. wow. And I mean, just even recently, Jurassic, the last time I went to the movies, Jurassic World had been open for a couple weeks, and it was on three, four screens at a 10, 12 screen theater. So if Jurassic World does that well. Yeah, I can't see Star Wars not having half of every theater across the United States. Star Wars is number two for adjusted domestic gross of all time and it's at 1.4 billion that's domestic just domestic not worldwide wow there you go which is why i think star wars is going to make all of the money it's certainly getting all of my money the (laughs) only thing if it was a may release i'd say absolutely but it's a christmas release i just don't know you must like your family a lot more than most people do I, well, it's not that. <laughs> it's a good family. It's that there's travel involved, and that takes away time that you can go to the theater. They don't got movie theaters in other places? No, they do. It's just the time. Like, the travel is an all-day thing. Yeah. I can back him up on that, you know, as a fellow dad. It's, uh, you know, I say all the time, I saw pretty much every movie that was made before 2003, and since then, eh, not so much. You know, it's not that I'm not interested. You just... uh you mean to go see a movie and next thing you know, it's six months later and you're catching it the second time it's on cable, if you're lucky. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll see. December is coming. We'll have to review all our picks later this fall before the movie comes out and we'll go with that. Ferris, did you make a prediction on this? Yeah, I forget what it was, but uh, it was okay. something. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll have to go back to your earlier podcast with us and we'll go through it. All right. So that's all we have for feedback this week and we're gonna walk this one out actually instead of walking it out that bump makes me think of skipping it out yeah i do a little (laughs) dance every time i hear it (laughs) dance in the seat all right we want your feedback go ahead give us a voicemail 844 the bus one 844-843-2871 We are science-inclinated people. You can give us a question on that. We can always call Ferris back if we have a music question. I'll be here for you. Yeah. (laughs) Well played, sir. Nice poll. Nice poll. And, uh, you know, how awesome Haley Atwell is. That's always good. Or Agent 13. You can do that, too. Or Rosario Dawson. There you go. (laughs) 
Next week, we are going to leap forward into the next Daredevil episode, Nelson versus Murdoch. And that is going to be awesome. Can't wait to watch that again. We have a website, legendsofshield.com. We're part of the gunnageek.com network. You can also catch us there. We have a Facebook account, Twitter account, Tumblr account, YouTube channel. Just search for Legends of Shield. You will find us as well as forms at forms.gunnageek.com or what, Haley? I don't know. What's next? Search Gunna Geek <laughs> on your Tapa Talk app. Tap, 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 tap. There you go. <laughs> All right. Ferris, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It is always a pleasure to have you on. We really appreciate you spilling your knowledge on Daredevil. <laughs> you know you know me, Star Pi. I'm a spiller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's he said. Not as much as Sean, let me tell you. No, but thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. I love the community. You know, we go way back to the place with the thing, and it's uh, it's great to see everybody doing what they do. Absolutely. So thank you, our listeners, our live listeners, through YouTube, through Mixler. We really appreciate the comments on our chat wing site. You can find that at gunnageek.com slash live. Yeah, check that out. I put up some links to uh, Ricky J throwing cards. Uh, oh, I see... Uh, Haley also has the box office mojo all time adjusted movie gross links. And there's also uh, Michael B. Jordan in the Creed trailer, which I put up. If you haven't seen the Creed trailer and you're still on the fence about Michael B. Jordan, go watch that and then tell me he's no good because he's awesome. Plus Fruitvale Station's up on Netflix now. <laughs> yeah, it's not the most uplifting fun movie, but he's good. Well, no, but I like to watch really depressing things while I knit. <laughs> Eesh, that'll get the job done. <laughs> and uh, thank you to everyone who follows us on Twitter, whether you're just tweeting us throughout the day just because, or if you have a news story for us, or if you're responding to the live tweets or whatever it is, we appreciate you. Thank you to Neil and Adam for sending in those audio clips for this week and every week that they do that. We really appreciate that, too. We do. So thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. I'm Agent Lauren. I'm Intern Ferris. <laughs> moving up moving the, on up. Moving on up. Self-declared intern. <laughs> we'll have that interview and we'll discuss your position afterwards. Bye. Bye. Later. Peace. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunnageek.com and you'll find all of our contact information in other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod and can be found at incompetech.com. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual host and do not represent Legends, Stream, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation. No infringement is intended. And on my podcast, you're allowed to swear and make poop jokes. So <laughs> I can handle that. I try not to, but sometimes it slips out a little bit. The swearing, not poop. <laughs> well, no som- judging. Sometimes. Are you still in school, Haley? No. Nice. What are you doing with yourself? Not living up to my potential. Yeah, join the club. About to get promoted to manager. Woo. Wow. You know, I was... <laughs> <laughs> One of my standard lines to people is like, if you're not careful, you're going to wind up in charge of something. You better start messing up. And it sounds like you're doing that. You need to start <laughs> up things left and right. Well, what I really want to do. Some kind of irrevocable position of responsibility. Also, apparently, I accidentally called Stephen Amell a fraggle on uh, <laughs> Twitter just now. Accidentally. Well, I thought he said he was a fraggle. What did he actually say? That he was fragile. Oh, yeah, clearly. Fragile. <laughs> yes. Well. Such a delicate little little lad. I'm I'm surprised they have not found an excuse to have him do the ladder trick again. Oh, the Maybe ladder. he can't do it anymore, but Well, because I, he's like, I'm gonna eat food instead of being super duper ripped all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean I can respect that. So selfish. Yeah. As much as I would like to see, you know, abs. I'm like, no, no, as somebody who really loves to eat, I can respect that.
I guess I can go watch season one again. All right, I'm going to go live on Mixer, guys, okay? Oh, okay. Uh, I will stop saying the F word. I make no such promises. Hold on, my mouse froze. Stay, you, uh, need to okay, stop bring, is, you, you need to stop bringing home that liquid nitrogen. I did nothing. I'm fine now. <laughs> if you're responding to the live tweets or whatever it is, we appreciate you. Really? What? Uh, thank you to Neil and Adam for sending in those audio clips for this week. Mixler folks, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. You can catch us on the same time, same channel next Wednesday, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central, and so on and so far. Same bat time, same bat. That's DC. It's DC. Ever. I don't care. Ah, bye, Mixler. Bye-bye. Broadcast has been successfully terminated.